we're open to everyone to kick it off if anyone's got questions for Jody and uh, we can go from there. Okay. I always have questions. I know. We love <laughs> you for that, John. It's awesome. I'm like, I always count on John for good questions. Yes. Thank you. I don't know how familiar Jody is with the Gitcoin grant program that they do on a quarterly basis, uh, where they deploy a quadratic funding model. Jody my... works with Gitcoin, so she's a pro. She's Okay. Yeah. So I've labored through the process a little bit and managed to get a profile up. And as I understand it, they had a first round, or I'm not really clear on how the rounds were. It was first round, there's a second round, and they're, I believe they're in a phase, either a first or second round right now, between the 15th and the end of the month. And so we got a profile up, and I take it that profile displays what our project's all about and everything. And, and then it goes into a live um, model and then it crowdfunds. I guess the, the platform itself crowdfunds. And then somewhere along the way, quadra quadratic funding enters into the fold. And they match funds if that phase is, is done. I, I just need to... I, I'm not very clear on how it all works, soup to nuts, and just going from one part to the next. And I was wondering if Jody or anybody could, Annie or anybody could offer some light on that, shed some light on that. Yeah, John, thanks for the question. I, so just a little bit of background. I left Gitcoin in an official capacity back in at the end of March of this year. And I understand that. I'm following grants round 19 now. So there might be slight variations between what I tell you and the rules from the public goods funding work stream that's managing the round, but I can absolutely share an overview of how it generally works. And hi for those who've joined, Jade, nice to meet you. I'm joining from New Delhi to tonight, uh, so it's good to see all of you. To answer your question, John, Generally speaking, it sounds like you've, as a grantee, have placed a, have uh, put up a, a profile about your project on the website, and I'm assuming that it's approved. If, in general, on the Gitcoin Grants program, when they run around, each project has to meet the eligibility criteria of the specific round that they're running. As an example, if you place a profile up that explains a sustainability project, you must meet the criteria that they set for that round, for that grants round, to be eligible to receive any of the matching funds through that round. Assuming that you've done that and they've approved you and you're live and you're set and ready to go and receiving funds, what ends up happening is that donors go through the grants portal and actually can filter and find your project. Sometimes they're highlighted in specific ways by the marketing team, the various projects in the platform. Donors will come to your platform and decide to give money. In the background, the quadratic funding model is actually working so that you, as donors give to a specific grant, it's basically keeping a tally of the individual donors that are giving to that grant. And then subject to how many individual donors are giving to that grant, quadratic funding is working to match additional funds from Gitcoin partners to that specific grant. That tally takes a while. So the grant round this year is running from, I think it, it just started last week and it'll run for two weeks. So two Fridays from now, I think that's probably December second is probably December 2nd or December 1st is when the grants round will end. Um, from there, the grants team is going to work to tally all of the various votes um, or, or donations in, in your grant. And about a week or two weeks after that, the matching, the matching funds will actually um, be added and uh, added to the total um, for your grant. 
and the sum total of what you got in individual donations plus the matching funds from the partners will be transmitted to your organization. So that, that's generally how it works. But like in the background, they're looking at each of the individual donors or wallets that are contributing to a grant and working to match the funds using graduate funding. Does that make sense? Yeah. In, in our case, we're qualifying under the community commons category. Cool. Which means we don't have open source software project or anything like that. Or anything. Is it an education no. grant? Is it like an education project? Correct. Largely an okay. education. In the profile itself, we didn't go into a lot of detail as far as the budget and all that. I, I don't know how all that works either. I've, I have gone through some of the tutorials and they're just, they're still open questions as to how the whole process works. And we're just trying to get the big story, the big picture here. And our wallet is connected and all that. And so we get that phase. And, but they talk about rounds. Is there any vetting process that takes place uh, between the time, between now and December 2nd, as you refer to, with, along, along that phase? So each, group, each round that they run, so there's the community commons, there's ETH infrastructure, and I think there's a third round that they're running this in GR19, and I can't remember it off the top of my head. Apologies. But there are round managers, so often like more than one, like a round manager and some assistant round managers, let's just say, that are going through each of their, they're assigned to, say, the community commons. They're going through and vetting each of the profiles during the round. I think they, in previous rounds, they've set a deadline for reviewing grantee applications by, I'd say, the Wednesday after the round starts. And unfortunately, in the past, the only way to tell if your round is, if you've been deemed eligible for the round, is to go back and check your profile. They are available to answer questions using support at gitcoin.com or by using the support Discord channel to just ask the question Can somebody help me figure out if my round is live? And that's a way of just verifying. But usually you have to wait until you have to give it a couple of days to make sure that you're, you've met all the criteria. And if you have follow-up questions, you can basically just ask like why your grant wasn't made eligible, but it's usually, it takes a couple of days. But if you had everything up on the, your profile by the start of the grant, usually it just takes two to three business days for them to verify that you've met the eligibility criteria. Uh, for your profile to go live and start receiving donor um, donations. Sorry, I'm a little, I time traveled a bit in the last 24 hours. It's Monday, it's, it's Tuesday. It's midday Tuesday right now where you are. Okay, yes. Yes. midday Tuesday. By midday tomorrow, if you haven't heard, I would probably, if you're already on the Discord, I would go to the support section of the Discord and ask a question. Just okay. ask to see like how much more time they need to verify your your profile. Is there any onus on the fundraiser to make a donation anywhere or anything like that? None. Um, okay. It's it's meant to be community led and for folks to upvote. And you should highlight amongst your community that your grant is live and that they should donate. But no, largely. The goal is for the grant to be live, depending on the narrative that you've told. Usually community folks who are looking for specific things to donate to usually go through the profiles and decide to spread their donations among a few organizations that they really like. And then those donations will filter through along with the matching funds toward at the end of the grants round. Now, a part of that is also making a connection to Twitter, your Twitter account. As well. As a means of verifying that you're a real person, yes. Ex Execute. Okay. All right. If you're and on Twitter, you should absolutely feel free to say, like, when you get the yes, your profile is live, mm -hmm. there's you should go on Twitter and say, like, Hey guys, I have this great project that I'm contributing to and leading. Would mean a lot if my community would donate to it big with big denominations or small ones. 
and all of those folks that choose to donate are essentially contributing to your quadratic funding, what you end up getting at the end of the grants round. And so there's also, is there not also a Telegram channel that provides tech support as well? There may be, John, but uh, I, again, I couldn't give you the details of that because I'm not at Gitcoin anymore. I can ask, but I can ask around. I have a friend that still works there. And if I can get your contact information, maybe I can connect you to the Telegram account. Is that, sure. would that be helpful? Yes. Absolutely. I would also yeah. be wary that a lot of scams happen on Telegram. So even within authentic Telegram channels, that scammer might come in and then like direct message you and be like, hey, I hear you're having trouble. I'm with Gitcoin. Give me your wallet address and send me this. And you can get scammed quite easily there. So I would just be like extra cautious. Um, I prefer Telegram. Discord. I, I'd like being admitted to the Gitcoin Discord means that you've been verified. And then going through that channel for getting for seeking support usually helps you and will definitely help you avoid the scammers. Um, okay. And that Gitcoin server is called Gitcoin Grants is the name? It's the called name of Gitcoin DAO. And then there's a section within that with when you scroll through the sub layers of the Discord, there's a support section. It's usually at the bottom of the Discord or it was at least when I was when I was there. Um, and you can submit a support ticket that way. Okay. Thank you. It's very helpful. Appreciate it. No problem. Good luck. Welcome to our new also, summers. Can, do, you, do you want to plug your grant? I would love to hear more about your grant. Maybe the folks on this call might want to donate. Sure. Absolutely. Basically, we're, the mission of our organization is to provide community uh, resilience, greater community resilience in disasters, natural man-made disasters. As a consequence of that, there are health impacts that occur in natural and man-made disasters, not to mention migrations of people. And uh, the project itself would largely bring awareness of the necessity, the critical, um, the critical sensitivity that populations have to disasters and their health impacts. And right. so there's a lot of potential in Web 3.0 that could um, help these populations with preparedness and storing medical documents and things like that in the cloud and the blockchain. And so that's what we're looking at is bringing greater awareness to these populations and to NGOs around the world that the potential block three point, blockchain technology, Web 3.0 has, particularly to store medical information and make that in the ready for those who do have mobile phones and yeah. uh, smartphones. And so... That's what we're trying to educate people about. And then it breaks down the communities. We break in our profile, we break down the different communities that are highly vulnerable to disasters. And what's it called? It's called the Dare to Prepare Project. Awesome. That's really cool. So, Thanks. I, 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 um, I'm glad. But yeah, that's so necessary. I've worked on two resiliency projects, one after Hurricane Sandy, and then really now I'm working with an organization in North Carolina in the United States that is trying to rebuild after Hurricane Maria. Their levees just never work. Um, and now they have to rebuild this entire community. So, so much just history uh, is lost from in, in, in those natural disasters, let alone just like important documentation, social security cards, driver's licenses, et cetera, birth certificate um, that make it hard to do everything from secure another driver's license to voting in many cases. So that's a really important project in my opinion. Thank you. Put for, up a, if, you, if you have a link to the grant profile, 
Maybe you can share it in the chat. Let's see here. I should have, and I've got it. I guess I've got to yeah, find on, out on your own time. Right, we'll now I'm clear, right now, I'm not clear whether the profile is live or the profile is not live. And so I'm trying to figure out where that sits. But no pressure. And, but I will do, I'll put up a PBS documentary, a short documentary they did on the vulnerability of special needs populations to, to disasters for people with access and functional needs. Thank so uh, I'll, I'll get a link into the chat on that. A great little piece on it. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to hunt around, see if I can find that while others are asking questions. Larry Jade, iPhone 873. Do you guys have any questions for Jody? Anything you're not clear about on blockchain in general, or you want to talk about your organization in particular? We're happy to take your questions. Sorry to get late. I'm still too getting oriented here, but I'll just listen until I can say something and tell I will say this is the perfect opportunity to say completely unintelligent things. We are all friends here. And Jody in particular is a super great resource for explaining the basics of everything. So if there's anything in particular you don't understand, definitely go for it and we can walk you through it. So that's no barriers there. <laughs> Jade, do you yeah, have any questions? Also, iPhone iPhone 873 said that they definitely do understand the blockchain. So I would love to, maybe we can tag to you. Wow, it's a quiet group today. Nothing wrong with that. Jade's saying, thank you. Just taking it in. Happy to be here. That's awesome. Jade, I don't know if you're interested. Do you want to tell us about your organization and we could maybe suggest some ways that you could incorporate blockchain into it? Sure. Is it okay if I keep my camera off? Yeah, of course. No problem. Yeah. Okay. We love anonym anonymity and in, in crypto <laughs> is a big thing. Um, so I work at a, um, an organization uh, in Los Angeles and we provide um, different wellness workshops and, for women who have been diagnosed with cancer. Um, so we have day retreats um, and weekend retreats. We have um, free just really tapping into the more alternative mod modalities that aren't necessarily approached, although they are starting to a little bit more now in the traditional medical field. All free. Yeah, it's a lot of fundraising, but really great work to be in. And how do you, how do you fund the organization? Is it just through uh, donations through your website? Is yes, it... so it's all private donors and it's, yeah, all private, privately funded. So we have, right now we have a pretty select, like our, we have two major fundraisers that have pretty much the, the same invites every year and they've really sustained us where we were founded in 2005. Um, and so, yeah, we have had that like constant flow, but we are recognizing that we need to di diversify and even how we fundraise. But currently, yeah, we we have a handful of different events that allow us to, to fund that. That's awesome. We talked about at the end of last week's webinar, we did talk about a couple of organizations in Web3 that allow um organizations like yours to receive crypto donations through their websites you eureka pay was one of them and i'm forgetting the other one it's uh givingblock.com and right. you could pay i'll drop the links into the chat yeah so if you are active online active on twitter are promoting your organization regularly that way there's always the opportunity to just amend your website to begin re receiving crypto. And then the other ways, the route that John is going, increasingly Gitcoin through its protocol development is allowing, is creating a pathway for a lot of organizations to begin running their own grants round, own grants rounds, I should say. Um, and there's a lot of information on their website about 
that protocol and like the work that they're doing in order to one one of the main this like round manager is the technology that underpins it. So if ever you're interested in just like running your own kind of digital grants round that way and working within your own network to receive those funds, that's like a way of doing it. It is just a little bit more intensive than passively integrating or receiving your crypto through Yuka Pay or, or the giving block. But that's another avenue. Or like John, you can run around that qualifies on through an organization like Gitcoin to receive it. Gitcoin tends to focus a lot more on, on education within crypto, like onboarding folks to crypto and, and ETH infrastructure, the folks that are actually building in uh, open source software that supports the Ethereum network. So that's the way where the lion's share of the money that they raise through grants rounds go. And so maybe figuring out how to onboard to round manager and run your own rounds and create your own ecosystem through your community is another method of raising funds okay. or passively receiving funds through you could pay or the giving block is a third option. Anything you would add to that, Anne? I would definitely recommend starting with the passive piece. It's so easy to set up. Um, it's really, it doesn't cost a lot of money to do. And because it's just like new revenue, sometimes it's easy to sell that to leadership. To say, let's in, here's a new way we can get revenue. Let's give it a try. And then you can get a sense of, okay, is this something that crypto people are interested in donating to? A and... Do we have a lot of crypto people in our community already that are giving? And then I think if the answer to that is yes, and you're getting a lot of support from this niche of people, then I would say upgrade to more of what John is doing or running your own rounds. But I think as a toe in the water, just passively accepting is a really easy way to, to get started. Hey, that's good to know. So what exactly is... The process for what John is um, doing. There's like a passive and act. What's I'm not really clear on that. Yes. So John can also, I think John should also draft, jump in and just explain a little bit more of the process that he's been through thus far. But John is seeking funding through a Gitcoin round. Gitcoin runs grants rounds once a quarter. They, over the last couple of years, Gitcoin has actually just developed a really strong community of folks with that are in the crypto space or Web3 space that are interested in public goods funding. How you just like how you define public good is commonly up for debate in crypto. But I think the thing that you need to know is that through these rounds and quadratic funding, which is like this wonky mathematical way of democratically distributing money through a grants round, they've raised money for really small projects through these rounds. Mm -hmm. The trick with Gitcoin is that it is community-led. The community has decided with Gitcoin that they mostly want to donate to organizations that are educating and therefore onboarding more people into crypto and, and them learning more about the technology. They want to, the second group of folks that Bitcoin tends to fund are folks that are building infrastructure for on the Ethereum network. So it's a lot of engineers that are building extensions and expanding the universe of what the Ethereum network can do with ETH as the baseline cryptocurrency. And then the third place that they tend to give to more often than not is around sustainability initiatives. So organizations that are building on the blockchain projects that are either, I don't know, as an example, making our voluntary carbon credit market more, less scammy, <laughs> as an example, making the carbon credits trackable. So you actually, the, the projects that are being executed on the ground actually are worth what they are being charged on the volunteer carbon credit market. That's not, a, and, the, and those are just high level, the three categories that I've seen Gitcoin fund the most over several grants rounds. 
because of the nature of their giving and like the fact that our community is most interested in giving to those three categories, Bitcoin has developed eligibility criteria to be featured in one of their grants rounds. As an example, John's project, Dare to Prepare, in order for it to receive funds from Bitcoin's community, it has to meet the eligibility criteria that Bitcoin has set for that grants round for that sustainability round. Once they've approved John's grant, can, is John or John's project then receives funds from the community uh, through quadratic funding. And then through quadratic funding, his project is matched. So that whatever the donors have given, Bitcoin's partners are going to match it that much more based off of popularity, essentially. And it is a process to be approved and then receive the funds through Gitcoin. And that's why I said there is also this third option where you and you decide that you want to do the work of running your own round. That just requires more onboarding on both your part as an organization. And because you're the one that is going to have to learn the technology to run the round and then to onboard your community to start receiving funds through through cryptocurrency. And Anne's point is correct, right? Running your own round is definitely the most complicated one. I'd say trying to qualify for Gitcoin's grants round is, um, takes a little bit of time, but once you're in, you, you can receive funds that way as well. And once you've done it once, you know how to do it in subsequent quarterly grants rounds. Yeah, I, I'd like to think about Gitcoin as being like a, a version of Kiva where you pop on there's a website, you can see hundreds of different projects that you can donate to, but all the donations happen in crypto. And then there's all this matching money that instead of matching it a dollar per dollar, there's like a different mechanism to support projects that have a lot of support from people, no matter how small the donations, rather than projects that have one or two guys donating a ton of money. So that's what it's like. I think that the, the, Really good thing about it is you can make we can make a lot of money like for really small projects, as Jody said. Like for small projects, it's hard to get fun from places. This is a great way to do that. The downside is for nonprofits, you have to learn how to open a wallet and manage the private keys. And then you have to get somewhere. All the money you're gonna get is in crypto. So you have to figure out how do you exchange that for local currency, which is all totally doable and is not that hard, but it has to be done. And I always just say your first foray into crypto should probably not be Gitcoin grants. It should probably be like one of the, yeah, third parties that will accept the crypto for you. Just get a sense of, yeah, it's just an easy way to start. And then once you start learning more about it, you can open an organizational wallet, figure, figure some of that stuff out. That's probably how I would go about doing it. John, I looked up to your grant on Bitcoin grants and I can't find it. So I don't think it is live. Just to give you a heads up on that one. I would argue too, along the line that's been talked about, is if anyone's ever tried applying for a federal grant, talking about in the United States federal, the process you go through, through those are just onerous beyond belief, understanding logic models and things like that and having the expertise. And I could see how crowdfunding would be much preferable over applying for a federal grant. Not always, but uh, because you have to have an understanding of outcome models. You have to be very particular as far as researching and notice of funding opportunity. The, the private foundations may be a little bit different. But if you're trying to seek federal funding, or in some cases, you could even state funding, I would much prefer this model of fundraising or applying for grants over any of those. Just from what I've known, having applied for federal grants, being awarded for federal grants, and trying to understand that process, dealing with grants.gov, dealing with whatever your state level processes are. I, as a early growing nonprofit, I would much prefer a crowdfunding model, such as the way that Gitcoin offers and formats it. Just my two cents on that. 
That's good to hear. I was afraid that you were going to say that Quinn's process is as onerous as the federal government. And I was like, oh, that is like the opposite. Of- That's what I was thinking. He was going to say too. I was like, <laughs> yeah. No. Do you have any thoughts? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, thank you for, for sharing that, John. It definitely sounds like that. So there definitely is a learning curve, and I'm still still learning about just in general Web 3.0 and how it works and the possibilities. And uh, but I think uh, Anne's book and, uh, is a great way to start that. And go on Amazon.com and pitching their book in. It is a great book to really give you an overview of Web 3.0, what it is, and how you could place your organization in a funding strategy or a funding opportunity in the Web 3.0 environment. Love a good plug. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, John. That was great. Uh, we dropped the link in the chat there for anyone that okay. wants to take a look. It's specifically written for nonprofits and for mm-hmm. fundraisers with zero knowledge of crypto. So it's a good starting point. Um, I will definitely look into these. Any other questions for Jody? Oh, Lynn, go ahead. Uh, A little off topic uh, of the fundraising perhaps, but I was just curious if anybody had uh, read the Web3 book yet by uh, Alex Tapscott. He came through Vancouver last week and I had the opportunity to meet him, which was fun. And his dad, Don Tapscott, was there at the same time. And I have a particular interest in what he's up to surrounding the social contract. Uh, but I, as I mentioned, I haven't had a chance to get into the book to find out if there's anything really changed or revealing from the areas that you're interested in. I haven't read it yet. Jody, have you had a shot? No. No, I haven't. I haven't. Yeah, his first book definitely made the round quite significantly, particularly amongst like business professionals, um, which was really good for legitimizing crypto, which at that point in time was still, this was probably like 2013, no, maybe not 2013, 20, 2015, would you say, Lynn, maybe? So it, was, it really mm-hmm. helped, yeah, to make it seem more normal to the business crowd. Yes, definitely. He's a advocate that. And it's also got that nine point partner group that's in the crypto as well. I'm not knowledgeable and not into it at the moment, but I understand its use and what have you. And I'm patiently waiting for all this stuff to come together seamlessly. You don't have the issue of how to get onto a wallet and convert and back and forth. Reminds me of the old days and when it went from web one to web two, could have fooled me. It just was the same thing going on and on. I don't know why we've had such a seemingly barrier or hurdle to get over here in number three. I do appreciate the technical complexity and that sort of thing, but ultimately most of the people that we talk to on these webinars are in the choir. They know everything about it. The majority of the users are are not technical and it's like driving a car. You don't really have to be a mechanic. I hopefully, I'm hoping that the book <laughs> will shed some light on that this is going to become a uh, easier path. Thank you yeah, for sharing. Talk- Go ahead, Jade. You first. Oh, yeah. Just thank you for sharing that. I took note of the book and can definitely, yeah, I, it really resonates just hearing the reminder you can have as great of intentions as you want, but if if you're not just actually allowing and just going along with and not having your own kind of pre-existing things get in the way, then it can be something. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I think I mentioned this a little bit last week on the webinar, but it's definitely one of the bigger barriers to adoption in Web3 when the describe what you describe as like web one and web two just being like this seamless experience where you didn't really feel like there was very much more that you had to grasp in order to use it is hasn't really made its way in Mm -hmm. in creating a bridge between web two and web three 
And so you see these things where, in general, the folks that have designed Web3 have prioritized things like individual security and being able to manage self-sovereignty. So managing your own keys is just like something that people aren't accustomed to doing. Hiding your seed phrase in a book on your bookshelf and remembering where you hit it is just not a natural yeah. way to for, to for surfing the web. And yet that's how when you started off on Web3, you had to manage your wallet. And it, there's been, I wouldn't say resistant, but there's just, there is just a conversation, an ongoing conversation that's happening around like, how do you benefit or do you build the technology to, to promote adoption? Or do you build the technology to prioritize self-sovereignty and individual privacy? And there's, some, there's something that needs to happen in between in terms of the user interface to make it easy and seamless for people to use that hasn't happened yet. But I do see people building towards that direction. My, my husband worked at Consensus for many years and a lot of the conversations that they even had around MetaMask wallet were just that, right? The reason why no one's adopting this is because it's actually hard to use. And, but it is, it's moving in the direction that it should just slowly. Yeah. One would hope AI and if not even quantum computing should be able to address some of these issues. And I agree with you about the technology that it really should, uh, innovation should really respond to need as opposed to developing something and creating need. So I think the, the technical side of it, you can understand they have a, they're on one side of the fence, but the higher level of it is that we have to bring everybody on board here. And so that the idea of inclusion from no knowledge to highly technical knowledge, we all have to participate. I find it a little confusing that it seems to be tied up in the technical side. Maybe it's still just early days and I'm expecting too much, but I'm not technical. At least I'm on here. I managed to do that. Lots of people, that'd be a struggle. Lynn, you've been in the crypto space for eight years now. You are like OG, no? <laughs> yeah, but not on the crypto side, you know. It, I dodged the finance side deliberately. I was more interested in the social applications of the technology. And that's why I say Don Tapscott's social contract, or it, it, to me, is where it's, what it's all about. But the financial side, I have enough trouble difficulty with normal fiat finance, let alone crypto, yeah. being a little skeptical I, and not having no. usually deep pockets, but I'll get to it. No, and you're you'll great. You'll be the you're first great. person Lynn, I've looked to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Lynn and I met at a meetup like, like years and years ago. Uh, he's a pretty stable member of the crypto community in Canada. So he's being very humble right now. So but yeah, I, I would argue too that if you could take people from the known to the unknown and not every, I, when I think of web 3.0, I think of a cooperative governing model and then layer that on top with technology. And uh, not everybody knows how cooperative works. You can look as far as REI and understand that, but more of a mutual governing model that is patterns after a cooperative. Jody would know a lot more about this than I would, but, and then deal with the technology. Technologies, you'll run across developers who will tell you that it's all a bunch of hype and Web 3.0 is all a bunch of hype. And fact of the matter is, it's using, if you understand web servers and you understand peer-to-peer -peer web servers and, and you understand how co-ops work, you're, you're well on your way to understanding what Web 3.0 3.0 is. And then we'll good, good point. Yeah. In. They, it's, it's a democratic model, if you will. One of them and a good one. And what the internet was supposed to be bringing these two back together and sync is really important, I think. So that business models need to embed the cooperative form, if you will. Yeah. I 
oh, so much of what you said just now, John, resonated. There's so much that's hidden buffering the layers of business speak. Um, and just like coming from the world of finance, like finance is, and real estate, everyone likes to hide between acronyms and these phrases for talking about the work that they do. But the ideas are actually fairly simple. And when you talk about it in plain terms, folks understand they get what you're trying to get at with the technology and the technology should just enable that. So I think when you folks talk in terms of the work that they're trying to accomplish, things it's clear as day. I think we are winding down a little bit now. We maybe have time for one last question if, if anyone's got something they want to want to ping Jody's brain about. All right. Next week, these sessions continue. So next week, we've got uh, Robbie Greenfield, who's an incredible player in the blockchain space. He's been working on social impact applications for many years now. So we'll have him, I believe it's Wednesday. So he'd be great. And uh, I'll hand it over mm -hmm. to Billy for some last minute other information. But thanks for joining, folks. Yes, thank you. And and thank you so much, Jody. Sorry I missed the session last week. I was at Lab Week 23 in Istanbul. I wanted to just make a plug for a new thing we're starting. I messaged in chat john one-to-one -one and then the group but i want to just call it out basically we're we're trying to go we want to take these conversations and go deeper with makers people who are building projects like john is building his project he's it sounds john you've been building your project for many weeks or months and we're guessing that there are others like john that want to go even deeper than these group conversations to just narrow down on their project maybe find mentors maybe find new tools or custom solutions that they haven't considered, maybe think about positioning the project for funding, more traditional philanthropic funding in addition to Gitcoin funding. We're putting together a series of funder roundtables in the new year where we're, bring, where, where we're bringing, TechSoup is bringing together a group of program officers from foundations around the country and maybe around the world to have a discussion about the next generation of funding technology projects and civil society. And surely we want to bring together a set of maker projects in front of those funders, whether it's in real time or sending those funding program officers overviews of Web3 projects and civil society. So with all that said, if you have any interest at all, if you're building something or writing a proposal to build something, in the case of many nonprofits, that's how we work. We, we write proposals before we build things, typically, if we've been doing this for some years. We want to talk. And so in the chat, I've, I've sent the details of my email and a little quick form you could, if you could fill out, and we'll get back to you um, to schedule a, a, brief, a briefing about the Maker Studios. Thank you all for joining us. As always, for those return visitors, great to see you and hear from you. And thank you, Anne, for your guidance. Thank you, Jody, for your expertise. And thank you, Eli, for supporting all of this. Have a great one, and we'll catch you next time. Thank Thanks, you, folks. All.